back. So <laughs> it's a privilege to be here today uh, with you sharing the message. So for those who don't know me, I'm a fourth year law student at the University of Newcastle. Um, and my name's Jacob, which means supplanter or the replacer. And that's quite fitting because I'm uh, replacing Pastor Ernst today who couldn't be here because he's unfortunately sick. Uh, and as a last minute step in, please do forgive me if my delivery is a little bit rusty because I wrote this sermon two years ago and I haven't really practiced it since. Um, but anyway, so, oh yeah, cool, the slides are up. So I'm going to open my message today with a confession. My confession to all of you is that for many years of my life, I really hated having to sing hymns at church. Admittedly, I was kind of lukewarm and agnostic for a lot of my earlier years uh, in growing up in the church, but even when I started taking my faith seriously about four years ago, I still didn't really like having to sing hymns. There was just something embarrassing about it and not very cool, I thought. Uh, and because I'd taken a pretty heady route to my Christian faith through philosophical reasoning, Hymns were just the couple of embarrassing minutes I had to suffer through before church got to the real stuff, which for me was the Bible study and the sermon. Uh, not only that, but my prayer life really just consisted in uh, reciting the Lord's Prayer before I went to bed to try to help me fall asleep, and uh, maybe giving thanks as a quick ritual before my meals. Uh, for me, Christianity had become more of an intellectual conviction than a loving faith or a conviction of the heart. So if we can maybe go to the next slide, please, that'd be great. Awesome. So a similar realization was had by John Wesley, the Anglican preacher and founder of Methodism, nearly 300 years ago. In 1735, John boarded a ship sailing to the American colony of Georgia to engage in missionary work. While sailing one day, the winds began to grow stronger and stronger. The rain began to pour down heavily. Vicious thunder and lightning broke out, and large waves began to smash against the side of the ship. Suddenly, the main sail was split into pieces, and it came crashing down, covering the entire ship. Naturally, John found himself in a state of panic, utterly terrified for his life. Yet aboard the ship at the same time was a group of Moravian missionaries who had quite a different reaction. We can go to the next slide. The English missionaries John was with were screaming in fear whilst the Moravians continued to joyfully sing their psalms. Their calm, confident faith left a deep impression on John, and he asked them afterwards whether they were afraid. I thank God no, one of them answered. No, our women and children are not afraid to die. This response took John aback. He considered himself to be a deeply religious man, but this incident now made him question whether he really had a genuine and tested faith. Why had he been so afraid to die? Why didn't he trust God with all his heart? Was all he had head knowledge without a true love for the Lord? These were some very troubling and some very real questions that he was dealing with. Following more than two difficult years on the mission field, John returned to England and wrote the following in his diary. I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who will convert me? Who is he that will deliver me from this evil heart of unbelief? John had identified that he was lacking something deep and integral to what true Christianity is. And that led him to an epiphany that set England and America on fire with revival. Uh, I was reading the great, uh, the great Controversy last night in the bathtub as my sermon preparation, and I came across a line that puts it well. Wesley and his associates were led to see that true religion is seated in the heart. Wesley later said the following about his renewed and spirited preaching. I set myself on fire and people come to see me burn. What a great standard of piety for us to aspire to. So the question I want to pose to each of you today is, do you feel the same inadequacy in your walk? Do you need to have that same fire kindled or rekindled inside of you? If we could flick to the next slide. So let's now turn to a great example of the unrestrained love and affection that God wants from us in 2 Samuel chapter 6. 
you will turn there with me now, 2 Samuel chapter 6. So to set the context of this passage, the Ark of the Covenant, the representation of God's presence with his people in the Old Testament, has had an extended period of absence from its rightful place in Jerusalem. The Israelites had removed the Ark from the city of Shiloh for help in a fight against the Philistines, but the Philistines ended up winning the battle and they stole the Ark from the Israelites. Uh, That turned out to backfire on the Philistines, who then received curses for this theft, uh, and they tried to return the Ark back to a city in Israel called Beth Shemesh. But the drama didn't end there. Seventy Levites greeted the Ark uh, in Beth Shemesh, but were then struck down by God for unlawfully looking into it. Uh, In the Take Two trip, a similar thing happened. A non-Levite named Uzzah touched the Ark unlawfully and was similarly struck down dead by God. As a result, David became afraid, uh, and he temporarily moved the Ark of the Covenant to the house of a man named Obed-Edom. But now, it's finally coming back to Jerusalem after its long voyage away. So can you imagine the excitement in Jerusalem? At long last, after an extended period of separation and tribulation, the Ark is back. Uh, It's a scene that really echoes the promised conclusion to the whole story of the Bible. God is returning to Jerusalem to dwell with his holy people in triumph. We finally have the return of the king. So picking up in verse 12 now in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Now it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So in this famous passage, we see King David's open, genuine, and unrestrained love for the Lord. But we also see the disdain of David's wife, Michael, in response to David's reckless abandon and open affection. Partly, she's outraged that David is not looking the part of a dignified king, Maybe she's also jealous uh, of David's really close and intimate relationship with the Lord. Whatever it is, it's clear that she's more concerned with outward appearance than with conviction of the inner heart, and so she despises David's expression of love. And don't we all have a bit of Michael in us, uh, a bit of that tendency to despise the Davids of the world who seem closer to God and more devout than we are? Uh, If you can move to the next slide, thanks. On a separate but related note, I can think of a number of examples in the Gospels where simple people without great theological knowledge and training touch the heart of Christ with their humble acts of love. Counterintuitively, it was to them that Jesus said, your faith has saved you, whereas it was the educated teachers of his day that were so puffed up in their head knowledge that Jesus condemned them as unrighteous. A great example of this is in Luke chapter 7, verses 44 to 50, where Jesus praises a sinful woman who has anointed him with precious oil and wiped his feet with her hair and with her tears that she has cried out of remorse for her sin. So in verse 44, Jesus addresses the religious leader, Simon the Pharisee, who is judging the woman in her heart, sorry, in his heart. Verse 44, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much." But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? 
Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Again, we see here in the Bible a very raw and emotional response to the good news of God. And we also see a figure, in this case Simon, who doesn't get it, who simply can't fathom such an undignified and vulnerable expression of love for God. It's my firm conviction that this deep level of devotion cannot be something that's optional for us. Rather, the Apostle Paul makes it clear in Colossians that this sort of love should be the standard conduct of every Christian. So if you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, verses 14 to 17, we'll see that. So Colossians chapter 3, and starting in verse 14. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Uh, So if we can go to the next slide, that'd be great. So this love is absolutely core, but please don't get me wrong. I'm not actually here to trash on learning and knowledge, uh, and Christianity isn't just some wishy-washy, vibes-based religion. Uh, Let me explain. What we hear again and again from people today is that I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. What they mean to say is that they're all for the emotion, they're all for believing in the supernatural and a higher power, They don't like that this is to be organised and institutionalised through doctrines and moral laws that they are then accountable to. C.S. Lewis summed up why vague religion was so attractive in his day by saying that it is all thrills and no work. Lewis further, uh, further this point by comparing doctrine to the map that we need to use if we want to successfully navigate the seas of spiritual experience. He also pointed out that if you do not listen to theology, that will not mean that you have no ideas about God. It simply means that you'll have a lot of the wrong ones. Uh, So if we can go to the next slide now. Indeed, Christianity has from the very beginning been a religion of doctrine and teaching. By contrast with most of the ancient world, early Christianity was very much a bookish culture. A big emphasis was placed on translating and teaching people to read in the early church because they they wanted everyone to have access to the life-giving scriptures for themselves. And hundreds of years later, it was the Christian church that was the bedrock of learning and education in Europe and which founded the model of public education and universities that we continue to use. Even today, the Bible Society, for instance, continues this ancient tradition of education as a tool of evangelism, providing Bible-based literacy classes to the marginalised in many developing countries. Uh, Yeah, if we can go to the next slide, thanks. If we rewind back even further to the beginning of time, the opening of John's Gospel tells us that Christ the Creator was the Logos, or the Word. By this, John means that God himself is the intelligibility that orders the universe, and that communicates God's will into our minds so that we can have knowledge of the truth. Consider the contrast between Judaism and pagan religions at the time of Christ. As part of the Roman religion, if you wanted to know the will of the gods, you had to get a priest to slay an animal for you and look through the intestines, maybe feel the wind, and they could tell you whether the gods were happy with you or unhappy uh, on that day based on those signs. Uh, By contrast... Uh, Judeo-Christianity was quite attractive for people because it gave them a sense of certainty and predictability. Uh, There was no randomness and unpredictability like pagan religions. We can know that we are made right with God if we trust in the sacrifice of his son. It doesn't depend on intestines or uh, the, the changing of the wind. So turning back to the Bible, the importance of having knowledge is repeatedly emphasized throughout Scripture. In fact, the Greek word for teaching appears nearly 30 times in the New Testament alone. Paul even identifies teaching and having the word of knowledge as a spiritual gift, and among other things, Jesus himself was known and referred to as a teacher. Uh, 
After his death and resurrection, Jesus undoubtedly still expects us to learn from him and to seek knowledge using our minds to study his word. Uh, if we can flick to the next slide, thanks. The most famous example of this is the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 to 12, if you'll turn there with me now. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 to 12. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So... Here's what this passage doesn't say. The Bereans received the word with all readiness and believed Paul's teaching on face value, not really caring whether his doctrine was in line with the scriptures. Knowledge, teaching, and truth was clearly something that they valued greatly, and it's something that we should value greatly also. Uh, If we can move to the next slide. A final point I want to make here before turning to the final part of my sermon is that although it is fundamentally our hearts that God is concerned about, The reality is that accurate, clear ideas about God will lead us closer to love, whereas false ideas will muddle our attempts at loving relationship with him. This is why time and time again in the New Testament, there are warnings about false teachers. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 22 reveals the character of God, which is motivating his dislike of false teachers. Lies are an abomination to him, but those who deal in truth are his delight. Yes, the Bible is clear that knowledge of God is not optional for true disciples. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, God says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Whereas in Daniel chapter 11 verse 32, the Bible says that the people who know their God shall be strong. We can also see how important it is to have and to defend a true knowledge of God in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 to 5, if you'd like to turn there with me now. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 to 5. And I'm turning with you too, to make sure the timing is right. Okay. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we see here again the emphasis on the knowledge of God and bringing our thoughts in our minds, our understanding and our knowledge, into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So if we can flick to the next slide, please. So far, I've laid out two ways of relating to God, one way through our hearts and one way through our minds. Uh, You may not be surprised to learn that over the course of church history, this kind of division has been gendered to a certain extent, Uh, and they've also always existed, this kind of tension, I guess, between kind of a heart approach and a head approach. For instance, in the medieval church, it was generally men who focused on the mind and rational theology whereas more heart-focused mystic experience was reported uh, among women. An example of this is Hildegard of Bingen, who I think is on my slide there. Uh, she, She was a 12th century nun and polymath who reported receiving visions of a divine light throughout her life, which is interesting. Uh, So next slide, please. Now, these head and heart approaches to God can clash at times, but I believe that these two strands of Christian faith can, should, and must coexist peacefully uh, if each recognises the rightful place of the other. This is the point that I think Paul is making in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you'll turn there with me now. Um, Yeah, so the context of this passage is that Paul is giving instructions on how to properly administer the spiritual gift of tongues in the church context. So I'll pick up in verse 10. 
of 1 Corinthians 14. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so, you, since you are zealous for the spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? And this is the bit I want to emphasize in verse 15. I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. So we see here again uh, this idea that we're to pray and worship God with our minds, with our understandings, and with our spirits in our hearts. Uh, it's not really a one or the other. Either alone, in fact, is insufficient. This is also why, after the amazing spiritual outpouring on the day of Pentecost, Peter does not just leave it all there to the heart, but he gets up and he appeals to his hearers' minds by rationalizing the meaning of the event through the lens of Scripture. Ultimately, the key take-home from today is that we need to seek balance in our approach to the faith. I believe that this is one of the core points in the first and greatest commandment from the Torah, which Jesus repeats in Matthew chapter 2, sorry, Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 38. If you'd like to turn there with me now. So Matthew chapter 22. Picking up in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. In that statement from the Lord Jesus, you get a balance between mind and heart worship, which is essential for us to strive for. Uh, we can further see the equal importance of both by tracking some examples of the words mind and heart in the New Testament. If we can go to the next slide. Yep, that looks right. So the Greek word for mind is nous. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Maybe Pastor David could correct me. Uh, but here's some instances of the word mind popping up. So Luke chapter 24 verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16, but we have the mind of Christ. Uh, and then if we now look for the Greek word for heart, which is cardia, where we get the word cardiac from, uh, we've got Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So we see here, God really cares about whether your heart is close, um, regard, you know, even if your mouth and your mind is with him, is your heart with him. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 45 a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So we're getting this idea that our goodness and our sort of moral action really depends on the state of our hearts, and, and God really cares about that. And then finally, Acts chapter 2 and verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes... They received their food with glad and generous hearts. Uh, if we go to the next slide. A <laughs> uh, bit of a Getty image there, but that's all right. Uh, another key uh, scripture to consider here is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16, where the Lord says, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. If we only have God's laws in our minds then it's merely an academic study and it means nothing to God because there is no love there. 
Paul says even in 1 Corinthians that even if he has all knowledge and does every good work, if he does not have love, then he is nothing. On the other hand, if we only have God's law in our hearts, then there is no uh, direction to our love. We don't actually know how to express our love properly. In fact, we run the risk of doing something unloving through our ignorance because we lack godly understanding. A question you might be asking at this point is, well, how do I come to know God and how do I bring my heart to love him? Uh, To answer the first question, I'm not going to say anything that's going to be particularly surprising. Uh, Read your Bible to know God. But don't just read it. Listen to it on audio. Read commentaries about it. Uh, Learn how to interpret it properly. Speak about it with others. And meditate on its precepts. Make it a daily study and your first and last work of every day. But what about the heart problem? I feel like that's a little bit less straightforward. Well, the advice that John Wesley was given was to preach faith until you have faith, then you will preach it because you have it. And C.S. Lewis gave similar advice to the problem of loving God when one cannot find any such feeling in themselves. He proposes that the answer is to act as if you did love God. Do not sit trying to manufacture feelings. Ask yourself, if I were sure that I loved God, what would I do? Because when you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. I think that's very helpful and practical. Now, if you want to know uh, which way you lean on this mind-heart spectrum, here are some indicators for you to look for in your own personality. If you find your nose often stuck in Bible commentaries and Greek lexicons, and you can name all the books of the Bible in their order... Uh, you're probably more naturally a, heart wor- uh, sorry, a head worshipper and you should try making hymns and prayer a more regular part of your routine, particularly on the Sabbath. On the other hand, uh, if you love Christian music and you feel a strong emotional relationship with God, you're probably more naturally a heart worshipper and you should put some effort into working through your Bible and figuring out who exactly this God is that you rightly love. Uh, I will openly admit that I still struggle with the tendency to sort of over-intellectualize my faith. So this is a message for me as much as it is as, much as, it is a message for all of you. Uh, but I've been able to make some progress in seeking balance, and it's my earnest prayer that you'll all join me in that pursuit. Let's love God with all our hearts and all our minds. Let's not be anti-intellectual, but let's not be anti-spiritual either. Let's pray that God will do for us what he did for Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29. Give us wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Uh, I'll close with one last scripture, a wise exhortation recorded in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, that summarizes what I've argued for today. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity we have had today to gather together and praise you and rest. I pray, Lord, that you would set our hearts and our minds on fire for you, that we might seek you and love you with all our hearts, all our minds, and all our strength. May we never settle for either stale intellectualism or for misdirected emotions, God, but please help us to instead write your law on both our hearts and our minds in true devotion. We love you, Lord. We praise and glorify your name, and we pray that you would water the seeds planted here today so that our love for you might only continue to grow. Please be with us now and grant us your blessing as we head into the rest of the Sabbath day and then the new week ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.